There is a viewpoint among the people who have watched Revolutionary Girl Utena and the movie, Adolescence of Utena. It is that the story is a retelling, showing the events of the original story through Anthe's own perspective. Or, that is, they're looking at it in the way that it was marketed as an entrance into Revolutionary Girl Utena, a small sample to serve as an introduction to the main series. To me, both of these ideas could not be further from the truth. For in my eyes, the story flowed unaltered from the TV series' own ending. The prince is already dead, the battles already fought, the victory already won. The length of an entire movie to show what the TV series chose to show over the course of a single frame, Anthe stepping out of the gates of Otori Academy. So, while Anthe and Utena were the heart of this movie, I preferred the screen time given to those who remained stuck on the wrong side of that gate. Those like Shiori, driven to her black hatred at the thought of a girl's heart being free. Those like Toga, haunting Utena as he himself is haunted. The prince, dead hands still grasping at Anthe's heart. Toga is no longer a duelist in this movie, though he wears the uniform and dons the ring. The duels have been truncated, given only to Sayanji and Juri. Miki and Kozue's complex relationship lost in the shuffle. The look at sibling power dynamics, not the focus of this movie. Sayanji's role, though, remains exactly the same. He is the opening act, the introduction of the most blatant forms of patriarchal oppression. The concept that you can possess other people, that you deserve to possess other people, and that when someone is your possession, you also possess their love. The movie takes from him his relationship with Toga. That man is dead, and Sayanji does not know him. The hypothesis here is that Toga did not matter at all to this part of Sayanji's characterization. That even without a childhood friend to idolize, he had plenty of others to copy and envy and mold himself into. The play is different, the ending the same. The movie also takes nothing from Jury that life has not already taken from her. She is in love with Shiori, the locket once again hidden within her jacket. Perhaps she has fished it back out of wherever she dropped it, once again cradling that chain around her neck. Perhaps Shiori found it and gave it back to her. She is fighting Lutena for reasons she does not truly understand, but Jerry's heart is full of pain and jealousy and longing for miracles. She is happy for Tenna to be so close to escape, and so, so incredibly sad to find them both back here, in the dueling grounds. An alteration. Within the movie, the dueling grounds are not placed in an isolated stage, but fought with a live audience. Every student of Otori whispering, cheering, or groaning as the contestants fight for the rose. But no one can see Toga. He jumped into a river to rescue a drowning girl. Perhaps Jury's older sister, the one from her tail. Or perhaps Utena herself. And he drowned instead. And he is still drowning, even now. Toga's backstory is never revealed within the series. Instead, we only see what Sayanji and Nanami saw of him, the carefully curated images he showed them of his beautiful life that they could never truly have access to. It is desperately important to Toka that people be envious of him. He is drowning, 
after all. If people can't even be envious enough to say, that water looks so nice and crisp and refreshing, then what was it all for? Utena does not think the water looks good enough to swim in. Perhaps that is why it is her Toga chooses to haunt, even as Shiori pushes her against Juri. I hope she loses, Shiori's like. I hope they both lose. And they will, naturally. A duel that has two losers and one winner, that winner being the prince himself. Juri and Utena's duel unearths the coffin where Akio lies. The rotted prince. The rotted prince of nothing. Who killed him? Who buried him? Who stole his car and his keys and his castle? Every princess is a portrait of Anthe, Otori answers. Within all of them is the scar left by their prince. But this is about Toga. Had he won his duel back in the series, what did he want? Toga's goal is the realization of self. He wants to be strong enough that no one can hurt him, that he can enforce his own will on others. But the only way to gain that strength is to find himself working with Akio. Working for Akio. Sorry. There is a lot of imagery of Toga in Akio's car and in his bed. For all its subtleties, Revolutionary Girl Utena is not a subtle show. Within the realm of metaphor, everything that you see is happening, and the story will proceed with the understanding that it has happened. And, as always, this show is about cycles of abuse. People who struggle, who are in pain, and who keep making the same mistake, desperate that this time the world might be a little kinder to them. The idyllic childhood that Sayanji remembers is nothing at all to Toga. It does not exist. All he remembers is pain. Pain and that promise. Power. We know nothing of Shiori's past beyond the fact that she liked to have relationships with guys who were into jury, or guys that she thought jury might like. Honestly, though, that's more than enough. Shiori carries within her a deep resentment, a black hatred, I believe I said earlier. The movie amplifies this emotion because now she has something beyond her own relationship with Juri to hate. She now also points that hatred towards Utena and Anthe. To Shiori, she thinks that as long as Juri's love remains hers, she doesn't have to return it. She does not want equality. She does not want mutuality. She wants to be hopelessly pursued by someone more special than she is. And she wants to be a princess who has a prince. That it's unfair to Juri to be forced to be a prince is, if anything, a bonus. All of this is jeopardized by Utena and Anthe. Why would Juri be content with poisoned crumbs when she is watching others feast? Why should she be satisfied with a picture in a locket when she could desire to fall in love amidst rose petals? Should want to love someone who would watch the stars fall from the sky at her side. Though Akio is the only true winner, he is far from the only one motivated to maintain the status quo. The cage that places people in hierarchy creates people who only feel safe when looking down. But now Akio's in the ground, and everyone's looking down at him. He died, he couldn't survive Anthe leaving him, he was never alive, and every frame of him from childhood to adulthood was nothing but a walking corpse thriving on Anthe's love and fear and torment. From the grave, he still eats the pain born of his wretched existence. Let's put that aside for now. Shiori and Toga have found each other 
As fellow villains of the peace, they plot together, they whisper together, they tenderly paint nails and tend to each other. An idealized relationship, completely lacking in desire. They are both young, enveloped into a cocoon that smothers them. Break the egg, smash the world. They cannot even cut open these sheets, though they do want to. Perhaps that's my favorite part of the movie. Instead of an Otori Academy where no one is aware that a world exists outside of its walls, an Otori Academy where everyone knows there's something outside, they are all staring at that gate and wondering. Not even the Shadow Girls know for sure. Shiori confesses that her evil plot is as follows. She wants to condemn Jerry to be a prince forever, to replace the prince who died to save her when she was just a girl. She also has a rumor that she confessed to Toga. Jerry, she's abnormal. She's into, well, you know. And then somehow everyone spread rumors and the rumors have chased Jerry her whole life. Who could have done such a thing? In the character design of Utena, everyone has long hair. If you're important, your hair is long. And it flows dramatically in the wind or splays out on the bed at dramatically appropriate moments. It is never remarked on. Until Toka mentions it, of course. I grew my hair out at the customer's request, he says. This sentence means a lot of things, all of them unpleasant. But for right now, we are talking about hair. He has admitted that a key characteristic of his personality, of his character, happened not according to his own will. Toka's entire character depends on everything happening as he wants it to. He kept his hair long his whole life, and his hair has only grown longer in death. In my third essay, Envy and Androgyny, I bring up the fact that while it could almost be considered narratively appropriate to place Sayanji in his own version of, of the Rose Bride's dress for his and, and Toga's final match, in the end, that wouldn't carry through on Otori's themes. The duels are made not to enable gender expression, but to force even those outside of the lines to pick between the only two options that exist, prince and bride. To me, the fact that the entire cast has long hair is simply another addition to this forced nature. Even Utena, who has cut her hair for this movie, gets it back whenever she's in the dueling arena. That's what the customer wants, after all. In the videos, Akio is looking for the keys to his car. He had to take a taxi to the school because he lost them somewhere. He needs those keys to drive people around. Without them, what will he do? Become nothing but a passenger? Even if he's just a corpse on a puppet strings, how could he accept something as undignified as that? But of course, Akio's thoughts don't matter at all. All that matters is what Anthe thinks. Can she accept her brother losing everything? Yes, she can. Everything she gave to him, she can take away. She locked him away and she dug him out she holds the duels, and she offers the prizes, and she gets to decide who wins in the end. I suppose I should talk about the cars. That's the first thing I ever heard about this movie, after all. It's where Utena turns into a car. The entire school is a car, racing on that highway that Akio would take all his duelists out driving on. Another way you could say this is that the entirety of Otori is just another version of Akio's car, the transportation into adulthood through cruel means. She's in the lead, the Shadow Girls announce. In fact, she's the only racer. Until she isn't. 
of course. Now there's obvious reasons for Shiori to join in the race on her black car made out of hatred. She doesn't want Anthony and Utena to be happy, or to be together, or to escape. But this is a race, and a race has a goal. Getting to the exit. Getting to the end. I don't think she could join in at all if some part of her didn't want to be in the race out of Utori. But she crashes and burns, like she always thought she would. A road without Akio's highways awaits. But I've got to keep you trapped here with me for just a little longer. Toka is still drowning, after all. We know why he's dead within the narrative. He's dead because he drowned. But why is he dead within the story? Just to parallel Akio? Within the movie, Akio is dead because he's always been dead. All along, he was just some buzzing flies, masquerading as Anthe's Dios. Is there a puppeteer still holding Toga's strings? No, not really. He's haunted, of course, but he's haunted as Anthe was haunted by her own creation. If Shiori wants Juri to be locked into the role of Prince forever, then is that what Toga wants for Utena? That's the only prize the victor gets, after all. That, and the Rose Bride. But Toga doesn't care about the Rose Bride. He wants Utena to save him, unknowing of what Anthe's long discovered. Utena isn't capable of saving anyone, after all. Except the movie steps in to say, that's not true. She isn't capable of saving anyone, but of course she's capable of helping them, supporting them, offering what she can of herself to them. If you are capable of seeing her for herself, then everything in the world will become possible. Escape through an exit that didn't exist before the race started. Escape enabled by Utena as the car, and by the rest of the duelists, towing them along in a car titled Wakaba, named for simple, ordinary friendship. The decision must be made alone, but the escape can and should be aided, even by those no, especially those who have not yet managed to escape themselves. Otori doesn't have to be a lobster bucket where the claws keep everyone trapped at the bottom, waiting for the dinner table. The exit has been discovered. The Shadow Girls have seen it. Next time someone tries, maybe they'll receive better guidance, better instructions, more help. One day, Jerry says, staring at that exit. One day, Shiori's possessive touch might not be her only solace. So, the question returns. Is there a way out for Toga? He's dead, after all, and a prince besides. Every single location of Otori has changed from its TV series counterpart, except the observatory itself which looks as it always has. Is he like that observatory? Forever frozen, a relic of the system that killed him? No, I don't think so. The symbolism within he and Shiori scenes is not of a frozen eternity. It is a cocoon, a transformative state. They are still young, both of them, and not yet finished changing. Is it so easy to simply stop being the prince you died as? He would have to give up power. He would have to discard the rose symbol. He would have to look for allies. He would have to ask for aid in a world where barely anyone can see him. But he is not Akio, the one that never existed from the start. The opening of the duels to the general student body of Otori says this, You, too, could be a duelist, forced by your own lack of satisfaction with the world into a terrible, terrible game. The student council is not out of reach. They are right there, in front of you, 
join in on the illusion, don the rose, listen to the bells. There will be slots opening soon, after all. Some of these people are ready to leave for a world without roads. Hi, I'm Zar, and this is my channel for talking about anime, animation, video games, and whatever else crosses my mind. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that stuff.